Thank you very much. Hello, Minnesota. How are we all doing? You're mine for the next 30 minutes. This is going to be fun. You know, I'm going to start off with a negative note. I usually try and uh, crack a joke, but not tonight. Um, you know, when I'm out on the sea ice, sitting there alone for many months a year is what I do for my job, alone in camps, on the ice, or up in the Arctic tundra. So, uh, the longest I've been is three months without seeing another person or having access to anybody, uh, even a radio. You see things changing in front of your eyes, and I have to be honest, you feel alone and you feel helpless. And it's coming back from the field. I just came back from Antarctica on a big shoot. And you just, you're looking for that little boost of energy from a crowd or from somebody. And today I got that. I was so excited to come here to the University of Minnesota with the environment program and spend the whole day with the teachers, with the students, learning about how they're trying to communicate through photography, through storytelling, through multimedia, and then to see Jonathan Foley's introduction in the Momentum magazine. I was like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm amongst people who are all headed in the right direction. So thank you very much for, for having a chance to speak to a group of people tonight who are already in heading in the right direction. I'm not going to spend the whole evening just trying to convince you that climate change is real. We know that. The data's in. So the images and stories that I'm going to share with you over the next 30 minutes um, are from my assignment work with National Geographic over the last 12 years. But really, my, my journey to become a photojournalist working for National Geographic specializing in the polar regions began when I was four years old. My parents moved from, Bath, from Saskatchewan to Baffin Island to a tiny Inuit community called Kimmehut. There are 190 people in the community. We are one of three non-Inuit families. And in this community, this is in the 70s, we never had television, we didn't have any radio, we obviously didn't have any computers, obviously we didn't have any cell phones. We, had, we didn't even have a telephone on our wall, there was no way to communicate. So what do you do when you're bored between the ages of four and 14? You spend all of your time outdoors with the Inuit playing. The, the Inuit were my teachers, the ice and snow were my sandbox, and it was amazing hanging out, with, hanging out with these Inuit kids. I learned to speak the language and they would tell stories of Kadlupidlu, the sea monster, that would come and grab you and drown you if you got close to the sea ice, and the parents created these visualizations for us just to keep us away from the water, from the dangerous things. And so I began to draw as a kid just all these amazing stories I was hearing, and I started to really exercise my right brain at a young age. And I knew that I was going to do something someday to do with sharing information and an awareness about these polar regions. So I went off, became a biologist, worked on amazing animals such as polar bears. And we'd be out there for three, four months on the sea ice collecting this data, using all our survival skills to get this information. We would drive 20,000 kilometers, 15,000 miles by snowmobile, drugging bears and collecting data. And at the end of these major expeditions, all we would have to show for it would be a little data set of information, and there would be infighting inside the government. We wouldn't, we wouldn't share the data. We weren't affecting change, and I got frustrated. And I thought, now if I could just, but the science, they were good scientists doing good work. And I thought, if I can just bridge the gap between this good science and the public by doing stories for National Geographic, then now I have a chance to reach 40 million people. And that's what really drives me today to do the stories that I do. So what I wanted to do is, we, we're inundated all the time with information and news that sea ice is disappearing. We know it is. We, I mean, talking to Paul Douglas, you know, he gets it. Republican, he's announcing it. Weatherman, we know. Scientists are all in. I just, I just, uh, way to go, Paul. Big round of applause for Paul. So I just got back from Antarctica on a trip with Al Gore and, and you know, a bunch of other people, and important people, and his chief scientists and other scientists, and, and it was amazing. I mean, the, the data is overwhelming. It's happening. So what I wanted to do is do a big coffee table book, and between those 300 pages in this massive book, I want people to understand that if we lose ice, and we're scheduled to lose the summer extent of sea ice in the Arctic in the next five to 10 years. Originally, they were saying we we're going to lose that ice in the next 100 years, but I'll explain why their projections were off. But I want people to understand that if we lose ice, we stand to lose entire ecosystems all through the Arctic and the Antarctic. So I'm just going to, through the next images, I'm just going to try and share that with you. There's no better species for me to try and create awareness about the polar regions than the polar bear. Polar bears are marine mammals. Uh, they're comfortable in the water, but they get hypothermic if they're in the water too long. They need ice in order to survive. 
Bears are on the ice for eight months a year, but as ice is breaking up earlier every year and freezing later each fall, these bears are forced on land longer and longer. There's a place in Churchill, Manitoba, where bears are now sometimes confined on land, especially mother, denning mothers and cubs. They go for eight and a half months without eating anything. The population has already declined by 20%. They're having fewer cubs. They're, they're not as heavy. So we're already seeing change take place. Bears are an amazingly resilient animals. They, they, animal. they do not need a lot of ice to survive. And so these guys, this is just multi-year ice drifting around out in the ocean, and these bears are hopping from ice flow to ice flow. And as long as there's just a little bit of ice, they can survive. So here's a bear that we, we were sitting on shore, and there, was just a few, there were just a few chunks of ice floating by, and a seal was on one of the pieces of the ice, and we watched this fat bear swim out to that ice chunk grab the seal, drag him in the water, and swim back to shore and start to eat the seal. He ate an entire 600-pound seal over several days. And normally, I don't just walk up to a polar bear like this, but he was so satiated, so full, and so fat that, <laughs> that he would sit there, and he had his belly hanging on the ground. He probably had 200 pounds of meat in his belly, the, the fat's hanging off, and he's sitting there like this, and he couldn't move. And so as I walked up to him to get a picture of him, his only line of defense was to eat more seal. So... <laughs> So he bent down like this, and he grabbed some seal meat, and he started to eat. And as he's eating on one side of his mouth, he's regurgitating up the other side of his mouth. So I got my few pictures, but this is a fat, happy bear. As long as there's ice, there's food, they get to eat. And this, these are the bears that we want to continue to see. And when that ice, all that sea ice is gone, all that sea ice disappears, you get situations like this. this I was 200 miles offshore on a ship. And we're going by, and all of a sudden, we see on the middle of nowhere, in a little piece of ice, a mother and her two-year-old cub. And at this point, these bears are not eating. They're just hoping that they're gonna, the ice is going to get close to land and to a point where they're close enough to swim. The mother can swim long distances, but her cub is skinnier and can't swim as far before it gets too cold. Here is a... This is, by the way, I did a talk in Olympia two nights ago, and a friend of mine was in the audience. And as I was talking about this image, there was someone sitting behind my friend and they spent 10 minutes telling, explaining to each other why this picture is a fraud, why it does not exist. That cannot be, and, and I just need to let you know that I work for National Geographic, and if I cheated, I wouldn't be here tonight. So this is the real moment. This is a bear that is diving under a piece of ice, and his body's mirrored and reflecting on the surface. It was a complete fluke, because um, I, no, I just leaned over a boat and got the picture. But... These big males, this is probably an 800, 900 pound male, fat and healthy. These guys are designed to swim long distances. It's up in the Beaufort Sea right now. They're finding many bears that are floating dead in the ocean. And it's often these skinny little bears. I found uh, we're finding more dead bears on the sea ice as well. So here's a mother stranded on land with her cubs. So she swam to shore. Now not only does she have to take care of herself, she has to use up her energy to try and feed these cubs. So we're finding a lot of dead cubs as well. High mortality rate, over 50% mortality rate in polar bear cubs because they're not getting the tr nutrition they need from their mom. So talking about dead bears. Are you guys all cheery? Are you all nice and cheery? Is this a happy talk? So we are finding dead bears. You know, traditionally, when I worked as a biologist, even though we traveled 20,000 miles, we weren't finding any dead bears. And more recently, as we travel around in the Arctic and the polar regions, we're finding more and more dead bears on the ice. Change is happening. This is a little fascicle of the Arctic, this little pudgy dumpling of a ring seal coming up in the hole, scanning around, looking for polar bears, 100 pounds of blubber. And just to give you an idea of how important seals are, these, these seals are different than the harbor seals that, that we have along the, the coast, and the, the seals we have along the coast of Canada and the U.S. Up in the Arctic, these seals are life cycles 100% tied to the ice. And here's an example. When we were working as biologists, a colleague of mine, Ian Sterling, found a polar bear and she was starving to death. He found her in the Churchill dump. Her, she had no fat. Her skin was hanging off her. She looked like she was going to die any day. And he wanted just to monitor it. I wouldn't have done this, but he put a, a radio collar on her uh, just to monitor to see her condition. Well, they left her alone. Now, eight months later, they were able to track her down, find her, and they were immobilized her again. And they could not believe what they saw. This bear had gone out on the ice and had a very successful season. Does anyone want to guess what this bear now weighed from eating just ring seals throughout the entire winter? Any, any numbers? 800 pounds. She weighed 1,190 pounds. You talk about obesity. She could not physically walk. And so she went on to have triplets that year. 
was a super healthy, happy bear. So ice is important. We need ice. And this is why the scientists couldn't estimate why ice, ice was disappearing so fast. When you have beautiful white sea ice, the sun comes down, hits that ice, 98% of that energy bounces back up into space. But as the sun finally breaks through and as the temperatures are rising by several degrees in the polar regions, you have the ice starts to turn blue in the, earlier in the season. And as the sun hits that, it starts to penetrate the darker colors. And you get the albedo effect where the, the ice starts to absorb more of the sun's energy. Now you get black water on. This is a piece of multi-year ice. Now that ice is grabbing all of that sun's energy and it's just accelerating the multi, melting process. So this is multi-year ice, ice that should last for 10 years in its life cycle. But this is the ice that's gonna disappear and this is the ice that's key. And that's what's important about this picture. I'm diving under one piece of multi-year ice. And in that ice, you have 300 species of microorganisms in that one chunk of ice that's 10 feet thick. And in the spring, the sun returns to the Arctic. You get the phytoplankton that, glows, that grows on the underside of that ice. Then you get copepods feeding on that. Then you get the amphipods feeding. And then you get the Arctic cod. And then you get the seals. And then you get the polar bears and the bowhead whales and the narwhals and the blugas. All of that is, depends on that ice. Ice in the Arctic and Antarctica is very much like the soil in a garden. This is me in my office. This is what I do. Next time you're feeling sorry for yourself sitting at your desk, just think of this. I haven't had Botox. These are my lips, they're so swollen. They're just so puffy because I've been under the ice for one hour photographing. Just shrimp and little things that fascinated me. And I've come up from that hour dive and when I'm diving under the ice, after about a half an hour of diving, when I, first of all, when I descend, I get this, you get the cold water on your head. You've ever had a milkshake or an ice drink and you drink it too fast and you get that ice headache? Well, I get that over my entire head and often the result for my body is to vomit. It's just, that's the reaction to that cold, to that cold water, to 28 degree Fahrenheit water. And it's a bad place to be vomiting, diving under the ice in your regulator alone. So you have to be careful of that. You have to be aware that it's coming. But I've come up from an hour under the ice. I'm cold, I'm hypothermic. I can't move my arms, I can't feel my legs, I already have had cramping, I've already had shivering and the shivering has stopped, which means I know I'm entering hyperthermia, which means for me it's time to get out of the water. And so I have my camera and I, all I can do is I can't, I'm too cold to take my regulator out of my mouth, so I point my camera up and I do this with it and I'm going woo 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 in my regulator, telling my assistant, take my camera, and he thinks I'm saying, take my picture. So here we stand. <laughs> Here we sit in this standoff for way too long before he finally got it and he dragged me out of the water. And this is just me hanging out, waiting for something to come by, waiting for polar bears, waiting for leopard seals. This is how I work. You just, you need patience and passion in these places just to overcome the cold and the boredom. And I love this type of environment where I can just sit for many hours. And it's tricky in the line of work I do that every morning, that I wake up, I know there's a 98% chance that I'm gonna fail, that I'm not gonna get any publishable pictures. And you get up and you, it's in the Arctic, it's 24 hours of sunlight or Antarctica in the summer. And so you sit there and you, for 24 hours or 20 hour days, you're working, waiting, hoping. And this goes on for many months before you get the 12 images that Ge National Geographic can publish. And the, the diving is not the cold part, it's the luxury accommodation that we have to come back to at the end of the day. Here we have probably an 80 mile an hour blizzard, two huskies in camp, just in case polar bears come by and they just give us a bit of a warning, you know, our tent. We keep no heat in our camps because if we had heat, we'd never want to go outside and work. So we just keep everything cold. You get your heat by crawling into your sleeping bag. But this, it's worth it for me to go through what I go through to get these pictures. I'm gonna show you uh, many pictures tonight of charismatic megafauna, but this is the most important picture I've ever made in my eyes, is billions of these amphipods and copepods living underneath the sea ice. And here's an endangered bowhead whale, 60 feet long, from here all the way from me to over those chairs, past those chairs, 100 ton whale. And this whale, new science has come out, has come out saying that these whales could be well over 250 years old. They're finding, in, in, where they're still hunting them in Alaska, they're finding harpoon heads that they can date, that they're getting in the whales that they're catching now, that they can date to over 150 years ago. So this whale right here, this very whale, this bowhead, could have been born before the Industrial Revolution. And it's pretty humbling to think that because of the lies that we're leading in the South, animals like this are probably not going to be around for another 100 years. Walrus also need ice. This is just a picture, of a little video of myself and a walrus, and I just, this is just, 
a moment of action. sure why I adjusted my fleece vest. I don't know. But you see how the ice is moving? I had my assistant with a Zodiac who was spinning the ice for me to get the light better and to get a better background. And normally, we wouldn't push a walrus like that and have him come after me. I, I will, I'll spend 10 hours with a walrus like that on a piece of ice, keeping him really calm. But we were really in a rush to keep going, and I wanted to grab some quick shots. But this is the picture I got from that encounter with that walrus. Thank you. But walrus need sea ice as well, and so they can dive down from the ice to the clam beds that are 100 feet below. When there's no ice, these walrus have to travel vast distances to get to land, to rest, using up a lot of energy. Then they have to swim all the way back out to, to uh, keep feeding on clams. So we're starting to see how the whole icy ecosystem is connected. So here's one diving off a piece of multi-year ice. And we're just working on a story right now with National Geographic of walrus uh, feeding on clams, and I can tell you that they're more dangerous than great white sharks, and it's been a very humbling story to be in bad visibility, 100 feet deep under the ice with walrus six inches away while they feed on clams, but hopefully that story will, will come out soon. Now narwhals also, who knows what a narwhal is? Nice educated group, you're much better than LA and New York. <laughs> That's good. So I, same thing, I was on a story, doing a story on narwhals, and it was tying it into climate change again, but as soon as I started the story, I realized that I had to shoot a different story. The Inuit taught me everything. They were my friends. I'd been up on the ice with them for 10 years. The Inuit are shooting whales by the hundreds. They have a quota, but science has come out where it's showing that they sink five whales for each one that they land. The population is declining, and they also use a hunting practice where where they just shoot randomly, hoping to get a whale. Uh, that's how kids learn how to, how to hunt. Inuit learn by doing. So they don't know they're doing anything wrong, but they're shooting huge numbers of whales, wounding a lot of whales. 80% of whales have been shot at least once and, and wounded, but it's all to get the tusk. And so I thought, I went back to Geographic and I said, I'm tormented. I, I can't do this expose on my friends. And Geographic's editor, Chris John's editor in chief, said, I'll give you a choice. You can do the story now and, and face your fears or you can do it in 20 years from now when the, when the narwhal are all gone. It's up to you. So I went back up there, and not to expose the Inuit, but to force Department of Fisheries and Oceans to properly manage this species, which is under their mandate. And when you look at this whale, the one on the right with the big white scar, that's a bullet hole exit wound. And when you start to look closely at these whales, you start to see a lot of bullet hole exit wounds. So I would sit there at night with my, with my friends, with the hunters. I would count 150 shots throughout the night and in the morning, there would be just four whales sitting on the ice. And I knew that many animals were, and I'd watch many animals get sunk and get lost. And this is the hunting practice that takes place. The whales swim into a crack, they swim by, and then they just open up. There's not a newer rifle there than a 1945 rifle from the Second World War. The government provides them with free bullets. The ones, they're dressed in red because they're rangers. They're the, our first line of defense if the Russians ever come over to the Arctic. We have the Inuit with their 303 rifles to protect us. So they get th free bullets to train. What's so funny? We have a good military in Canada. So this is, this is their hunting practice. So it's, you know, I didn't want to take a picture of anyone's face in this situation. I just you know, wanted to show how it is done. It's not a good picture, but it ran in the magazine just to show how things, are, things happen. And so it's all about this ivory tusk. And I'm proud to say that because of our story and because of political pressure, because of pressure the public's put on Department of Fisheries and Oceans, that it is now illegal to export ivory out of Canada. But what was happening before is ivory was being exported to Switzerland, where we were going to the black market ivory trade. And that's where all the ivory's going. People were just shooting these animals for the ivory. And they also eat the skin, which is delicious. But now it's so high in mercury that it's not safe to eat. So that's a species story. These are just examples of stories that I do. So this is a story on the Great Bear Rainforest of British Columbia. Canada wants to take its oil from the Canada tar sands, a nice clean product, bitumen, and they want to ship our oil over to British Columbia into tankers that are 10 times larger than the Exxon Valdez. They want to run the tankers through these inlets. And so the First Nations came to me and said, we must do something about this issue. 
can you come and do a story on our area to help us because we don't want oil, we don't want tankers, we don't want uh, all of this industry in our waters. So I, so I went and I thought the smartest thing I can do a story on would be the rare Kermode bear. There are only about 200 left, 200 to 500, fewer than the panda bear in this huge vast tract of land, uh, way bigger than Minnesota. You know, great idea, great proposal. Geographic jumped on it, they accepted it, and then I sat there in the rain for the first month seeing nothing and pouring rain. And I sat there for one month thinking about what am I going to do with my next career because there's no way Geographic will ever hire me again. And also, I set up 10 camera traps. And so the spirit bear, the white bear, is a black bear that has a rare recessive gene and is pure white. And I thought if I can use this beautiful animal to show that lives in this habitat and it's connected to the ocean and the rivers and everything's tied together again, it's another ecosystem story, then I thought maybe one of my camera traps would come back with a great image. And I learned early on at Geographic that they're a magazine. They tell me all the time, they say, Paul, we're a magazine. Because I'll come back from a trip and I'll say, you know, it rained the whole month. I didn't get any pictures. I, you know, I broke my leg. Uh, I fell this. I lost all my camera gear. Nothing worked out. You know, I got robbed or whatever. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's so sorry. We're so sorry to hear. But, but sorry, but where are the pictures? They, and they remind us to say, we're a magazine. We can't publish excuses. We publish pictures. So, you know, you can't come back with excuses all the time. So for the whole first summer, I didn't get anything. I got this one picture. I was pretty proud that my camera trap got this. My editor said, that's, that's not a good picture. You can go back and you can do better. So it went back for a whole next season. And, and eventually, through working with Marvin Robinson in the First Nations, I was able to get a picture of a spirit bear. We got the cover of the story. It got voted, I think, the number one story of this year in Geographic, which is great. It means the reader's connected with the issue. And they even pulled another story and put in a separate story about the tar sands and the pipeline coming to this coast. So it became an important story as a catalyst to keep other stories pushing for the, for the same issue. Now, this picture I shouldn't be showing you. I'm always under a strict 40-page contract whenever I sign up to do a story for Geographic. And this story that we just did on Emperor Penguins has not been published yet. And so I said, but they're a really nice bunch of people in Minnesota. Do you think I can show them a few pictures? And he said, sure, I guess a couple. So I think I'm showing you about 10. But I get confused what a couple means sometimes. But we went to Antarctica just now to photograph emperor penguins underwater. We know all about emperor penguins, you know, their, their love journey across the ice to their chicks. But I wanted to dive under the ice and just discover their behavior. And as we're working, as we're down there, we get science that comes in that says that emperor penguins purposefully, consciously release bubbles from their feathers by the millions to lubricate their body against the water to accelerate their, their swimming speeds to avoid leopard seal predation. I'm like, sure, okay, let's, I hope we can see this. And sure enough, as the penguins are swimming under us, this is just taken, as they're swimming under us, the penguins that are closer to me got a little nervous. They would squeeze their feathers shut, shut, releasing millions of bubbles out of their feathers and accelerating at a much greater rate than the other penguins. And another thing I did, I swam up to a group of penguins in the water. I just wanted to see what they would do. And I charged towards them in the water. And they instantly together, like just in a snap, they released all these bubbles. And this is, I'm shooting 10 frames a second. And the next picture after this is just confusion and bubbles. So they collectively release these bubbles, just like fighter jets releasing flares, just to confuse me and throw me off. There it is, just releasing all the bubbles from its, from its crown, from the top of his head, releasing them from the highest point on his back and then releasing them down the, bellows, down the belly, just lubricating the whole bird in the highest points as it, as it fights friction against the water. And there's it rocketing to the surface. Incredible speeds. Thank you. I didn't show you these. When I'm on my deathbed, I know without a doubt that I will look back on one story more than any other that, that will just stand out of my mind as probably the greatest encounter the greatest gift from nature, the greatest moment I've ever had. And it's this story I did on leopard seals. Since the beginning of time, leopard seals have had, since Shackleton first went to Antarctica, leopard seals have had a vicious reputation. And they're not exactly fun, pretty looking animals. I mean, they look positively prehistoric. They're serpentine-like body, that funny smile on their face, their black holes for eyes. And they do they don't have hands, and they're extremely curious. They're aggressively curious animals. So when you get tourists 
in Antarctica in their boat, and they're all with their little happy shoot cameras, and they're all sitting in their big zodiac, all 12 people dressed the same, going, oh, isn't it cute? The leopard seal comes over, and it wants to see what the boat's made out of, so he bites it. And the rubber dinghies, zodiacs, are made of air, so the boat starts to deflate, and so the boat races back to the ship, and everybody tells their harrowing tale of how they escaped from a leopard seal. And so as a journalist, again, I'm, this is an, a story from another angle. I'm work, working on an animal's behavior. And so I like to dispel myths. So I put in a story proposal. I thought, let's go to Antarctica and get in the water and get to know as many leopard seals as we possibly can. I want to give this animal a fair shake. And I was also nervous. I mean, they, they, they've had moments where, I mean, Shackleton used to shoot leopard seals for dog food by putting a guy on the ice as bait and the leopard seal would fly out of the water, and as it was flying out of the water, they would shoot it. They do have a reputation of attacking. So we were a little nervous going down, but we said, let's just, let's just get to know this animal. And they also eat happy feet, you know, so they... <laughs> and we're very much a species that if a, you know, a penguin is cute, we love penguins, so whatever eats it must be awful and bad. Well, it doesn't, know, it doesn't work like that. The penguin doesn't know he's cute. And the leopard seal doesn't know that he's big and vicious. He's just, this is the food chain unfolding. But we're very much, you know, we like to dress our poodles up in pink sweaters. And so we kind of see the world a little differently sometimes. They're all so big. These are not little 100-pound ring seals. That is a big animal. That's over 1,000 pounds, 12 feet long. And just to give you an idea of how big they are. The hardest part of our journey for me was getting there. 700 miles in a 40-foot sailboat crossing Drake Passage, the roughest seas in the world. This is the first picture I took after five days of hurling my guts out in the bow of this boat. The boat, the year before I went, went inverted in the Drake Passage. We got knocked over on our side, but we didn't, get in, didn't go inverted. But it was a pretty harrowing trip. And my captain, I think, would start drinking wine around breakfast. So he was... A, I would too if I had, he'd crossed the Drake Passage 150 times in this boat. We didn't have any freezers on board, so we had to hang our mutton in, in the rigging of the boat and that let it get cured by the salt spray because we were hammered by waves the entire way down, 50 knot winds, 20 to 30 foot seas in this little boat. And this is Jill. Jill is the best looking assistant I've ever had. And when I was 17, 18 years old, and I first started to dream of becoming a National Geographic photographer, I had a different view of it. I thought, wouldn't it be amazing, you know, a geographic photographer on assignment, you know, in the Bahamas on a sailboat, girls in bikinis, we're drinking martinis. It would be a nice dream, but this is the closest I've ever come to that reality. <laughs> it's funny, I was, I was in Serbia when they launched National Geographic there, and launching, launching the Serbian edition of National Geographic, and I told that exact same story, just a little different, and and it was funny that later, no one really laughed when I said that. And later on that night, we're having a couple of cocktails at a bar and, and celebrating. And everybody got up to leave. And this gentleman sitting across from me slipped me a piece of paper, had a phone number on it. It said, I like men too. <laughs> so sometimes you just, you got to watch what you say in foreign countries. So we finally arrive at the Antarctic Peninsula after a week at sea in this little boat, tired and sick, and Goran Elme, a Swedish man who has experience with leopard seals, said to me, you know, let's just go out and look for a seal, just in case. And I'm all the way down, I'm like, we're not going to see any seals, you know, I'm, I don't want to fail this story. I get very neurotic on my assignments, thinking I'm going to fail all the time. And he said, let's just go look for a seal. So we come around our first bay, and there is this massive leopard seal. To give you an idea, that penguin is over two feet tall when it's standing. So this is a massive head of a seal. And Joran, in his deep Swedish accent, goes, that's a bloody big seal, yeah. So he got, he was really excited. And so the seal grabbed the penguin, came up underneath our 12-foot long zodiac, and started ramming it under the hull of the boat. And so we had to stabilize ourselves and sit down on the boat as it's lifting it. And then the, the seal goes away from the boat about, oh, uh, 10 feet, and starts to do this. He just starts to rip the penguin inside out. And this is what they do. They grab it by the head here, and he flicks it as hard as he can. You can't see it with the human eye. It just looks like a splash. But on you know, one four thousandth of a second on your camera, you're able to freeze that. And so he just whips it so fast, he turns the penguin inside out, and you're left with all this, all this meat, and that's what he eats. And now there's blood, and there's chunks, and there's fat, and it's all the stuff in the water. And I'm thinking, wow, this is scary. And Goran looks at me and he says, time for you to get in the water, yeah. 
And I said, forget that. You know, and then we ended up having a really heated argument. He started calling me names, called me weak, a chicken. Don't I have, you know, am I not brave enough? I complain about this story. I pitched it. I'm worried about failing. He, you know, his job is to find me a leopard seal as a guide. It's my job to get these pictures. He's like, just shut up and get in the water, yeah? So I sat there on the edge of the boat. Just, you can imagine how scared I was, just trembling. I had dry, dry mouth, and I barely parted my lips with my snorkel, and I put on one. It's going as slow as I can. He's like, hurry up. I'm putting on my flippers, and he said, the seal's going to go away. Hurry up. Put my flippers on. You know, my, he closed up my dry suit and slipped over the edge of the boat, not knowing what to expect. And this is the first thing that happens. So, but Yoran had said to me, he said, the leopard seals are known to do that. They will, and her head's this big. Her teeth are up here and down here. If you put your elbows together and open up your arms, that's how big the head is. It's this wide. And he said, you know, he gave me really good advice. So he said, it's going to do this to you. I think it will, if it's a normal good leopard seal. It's going to do a big threat display. And he said, when it does, this is your advice. If you get scared, you close your eyes and she'll go away. I work with really good people. I hire the best. <laughs> and I did essentially do that. I was shooting so much, just thinking this is my one moment, that, I mean, this is all going on, and I have to sit there and make pictures. And besides, I had a super wide-angle lens on, and it was way too terrifying to look over the camera because you realize that this animal is a monster. Underwater, things are 30%, look 30% bigger. So she looks like she's 16 feet long. It looks like a whale. And then she did the most amazing thing. She completely relaxed after she did threat displays for about 10 minutes. She got it out of her system that she was dominant. I was inferior. I was fine with that. And then <laughs> she went off and she grabbed a penguin. And she, I didn't, couldn't figure out what she was doing, but she had it by the feet and she stopped about 10 feet away from me. And she hold, held the penguin by the feet and the penguin's flapping to get away and she lined it up with me and let it go. The penguin swam towards me and went over my shoulder and she came across and grabbed it and came back this picture is no fluke. This would be a really hard picture to take. She did this 10, 15 times, where she constantly lined up the penguin, and it happened after like the 10th time that she was swimming by me. I swear that she would look over at me like this in disgust as she would swim by me, that I couldn't catch this penguin that she was trying to give me. <laughs> and so she realized that I couldn't catch a swimming penguin, a fast-moving, fresh penguin. I couldn't catch that. But I think she became really confused about why I was there. She, you know, I didn't run from her threat displays. She just tried feeding me a live penguin. So I think she thought, let's just go through the process and see what he wants in my water. Because she was the most dominant seal. So she grabbed another penguin. And she grabbed it, and she, she took it by the belly, gently like this, and she bobbed slowly towards me like this. And she came up towards me until her head was about this far away, and she let it go, and the penguin took off. She did that again. She did that a few times. And, that, and I'm just sitting there. I'm, I'm, if I wasn't laughing, I was crying, because it was the most amazing thing I am. Here you are, a photographer, and you're being force-fed penguins by a predator. <laughs> and all that fear I talk about of I'm never going to work again because I'm not going to get the pictures, this is happening on the first day of our assignment. I couldn't believe this. I knew that we were shooting our entire assignment on the first day. So that didn't work for her. So she would get other penguins, and she would grab them, and she'd tire them out and wear them out. And she ate every penguin she played with. Sure, I felt bad for the penguins, but leopard seals love to play with their food. They'll play with penguins anyways if they're going to eat them. They'll do this for hours. You see them putting them on ice. Penguin jumps in. They'll put them on the ice. They just, <laughs> they just love to play with their food. So this leopard seal, hit, all the white in the background is a, an iceberg. And I thought, this, wouldn't this be a beautiful setting to get a shot of a leopard seal. So I, everywhere I went, I'd swim over to this iceberg or to this iceberg. She would follow me with penguins. She'd come along, and so here she's, we're at this iceberg, and she's doing this really sexy ballet-like pose, sliding down the iceberg. She was rolling around like this, and like this, and then she'd offer me the penguin, like that. <laughs> Thinking that that would work. And I'm just sitting here shooting, shooting, shooting. Well, that obviously didn't work, because I still, I just did not want to touch the penguin. I just, because this, if, as soon as I touched it, the show could be over. I, this was driving her nuts. I just wanted to continue with this. So she realized I couldn't catch a live penguin, so she started to bring me dead penguins. She would drown them. <laughs> so here she's got the penguin swimming up to me. She would sit there, and all of a sudden I had several penguins floating around me, and then she would just sit there and look at me with a dejected look, like. <laughs> You don't want to be too anthropomorphic. You don't want to anthropomorphize. You don't want to put human behaviors on animals. But I swear, she was thinking, you idiot. 
you know, <laughs> here I'm offering you a penguin. But that wasn't enough for her. I just kept shooting. I still didn't touch the penguin. So she started to flip him on top of my head. <laughs> so I'm, penguin's on my head, and I think she thought that my head was going to open up and it was going to fall in. So she'd have the penguins up there, and I wouldn't move. I'd sit here with my underwater camera. The leopard seal's touching my face with her lips. You know, she's all around my face. She's behind me. She's poking me in the bum, and she's putting the penguins on my head. She'd go get another penguin and put it on my head, and I'm not moving. I'm just sitting there. This went on for four days. Every time I would show up at the penguin grounds in the morning, she'd come racing over to the Zodiac, race off and get a penguin, and we'd do the same song and dance again. And in four days, I shot my entire assignment. But after the fourth day, she started to get annoyed. She, she would start, I didn't know what she was doing, but she, in the animal world, blowing bubbles is a threat display. It's generally not a good thing. But she would come up to me and blow bubbles in my face and blow bubbles at the penguins and get angry, and then she'd be nice again. So she was working through her process, but here she's doing a bit of a threat display. I just stayed with her, kept shooting. And then once she turned over on her back, and I thought this was it. This is on the last day, and she did this deep, guttural, very loud vocalization, guttural jackhammer. She was like a cook, 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 cook. And I could feel it vibrate through my whole body, and I was like, okay, now I've done it. Now this is bad. And what had happened was another leopard seal had snuck up behind me, and she did this threat display. As soon as she made that vocalization, this big seal that was sneaking up on me took off. And she took off after it. She put the run on it. It dropped its penguin. She grabbed its penguin and brought me to the penguin and gave it to me. <laughs> she was incredible. So she was protecting me in that, in that moment. You know, I got in the water with 30 other leopard seals. And, and it's, I never once had a scary encounter. I mean, this seal gave me everything. And so, this picture of the seal on the ice is what I'm going to continue to do as a photojournalist. I'm going to continue to tie these animals to these ecosystems, whether it's penguins, which are at risk from climate change, whether it's these leopard seals that need ice, or the walrus, or the polar bears. That's what I can do as a journalist. I can listen to the good science. I can convert that into images, and I can tell my stories. And it's just it's interesting, just reading Jonathan Foley's great write-up today in the introduction to the Momentum magazine. He's like, who do we want to be remembered as is this generation? This is, this is our moment now. And he worded it so beautifully that this, you know, this is our moment. Do we want to be remembered as users and takers? Or do we want to be remembered as heroes, as, as people who turn this around, who finally can switch this all around to create change and to push political leaders and be careful who we vote for and to think about the environment and the habitat every day just as much as we think about money and every other decision we make? I really think that we can become heroes. Thank you.